So it's my great pleasure to come here to discuss my uh, recent research result with the such exciting diversified group. And uh, uh, so the work is done with my PhD student, Tian Yu Kang. <laughs> OK. And also, I'm so glad to have my uh, another student, Ira Zika, here. So she, I think she helped me get connected with this exciting group. So the, uh, I talk about this is the ongoing research project. So the project was funded by National Science Foundation in July. Then we get some preliminary results. So I'm thinking this is a talk in MIT, so I want to share my unpublished result with the whole group. So we get a journal paper submitted to the BMC journal a week ago. And uh, we have a paper submitted, but get rejected. We have three review uh, comments, two weak uh, acceptance, and one strong reject. So we're going to resubmit the paper again in January. And then this is work in collaboration with my two collaborators in Dana Faber. So Dr. Uh, Mir Mirik and John, so they both in the biostatistics department in Dana Faber. And then Kurash is my collaborator in mathematics department. And of course, Tim is here. Okay. So then uh, I'm currently supervising Knowledge Discovery Lab. So the lab, uh, since I joined UMass Boston in 2008, we already graduated uh, six PhD students. So now, now they're doing great e either in industry or in academia. And then so when I first got started at UMass Boston, I started with uh, three NASA projects. So I'm working on spatial temporal data. So the first one is we identify the crater. So impact craters from the martial surface. So this is uh, related with image processing, object detection. And the second one is about we analyze the time series data from the uh, martial soil data. We try to understand what is the soil composition for Mars. So we get the electronic tongue, so we taste the soil on Mars. So this is, uh, so this is temporary data. And another one is we work with the Boston Police Department. So we have five years residential burglary data. And we try to predicate when and where for the future residential burglary climate data. Then the next one is we have this quite exciting uh, outreach project with uh, museum, science museum. So we, have, uh, we work with the science museum for four years. So this is another grant from NASA, but this is an outreach grant. So we have a uh, two days Mars panel, Beyond the Mars panel with the museum. And my PhD student, uh, he already graduated to become doctor. So Dr. Joseph Cahun, he designed a really interesting online interactive games. So we have this Mars rover move on the uh, Mars surface. And then students can c use this uh, game driver and identify craters on Mars. And then we have this. Uh, ongoing uh, uh, HR1. So we just got this awarded about a year ago. So we do, we also do phasal activity classification. But this is more like for the free living setting. So free living setting is we have this accelerometer either mounted on the hip or on the dominant or non-dominant wrist. So by the end of the day, so this is not in the lab setting. So it's the free living setting. The subject can do whatever they want to do. But by the end of the day, we want to precisely classify what kind of activities has been performed by this subject and what is the accurate uh, energy assumption done by this subject. So the, the challenging part for this project is because, because it's not in the lab setting. You really don't have really high quality training data because you don't know what kind of activity can be performed by this subject. So if you want to do a scientific meaningful results on the accuracy, then this is a very difficult job. So uh, we expect to have some good result published, uh, no, submitted by the end of this year or early next year. And then of course, the one I'm going to talk about uh, also for that one, this is the, so this is the collaboration with Tufts University. So we do extremely weather forecasting. So currently we, we're working on uh, is how can we do precipitation prediction with 15 days ahead. Because for weather forecasting, the most difficult part is actually for the rain. How can you predict the rain? So that is why for the weather forecasting, you really get, you, you, you see from the TV set, they do like seven days ahead, because they cannot really do anything more accurate, actually, than two days ahead. So precipitation pr uh, prediction is very difficult. So you're working on that part. And then for the today's work, it's more like the machine learning algorithms with the genetic data. But then I use this example for the breast cancer subtypes to talk about the motivation why you want to do genetic data. So for the breast cancer subtypes, uh, people, currently people believe we have uh, four primary molecular subtypes based on the expression of HER2 hormone receptors and tumor grade. And of course, in 2017s, we started with morph morph morphology. 
and then we gradually move on to the next generation sequence like DNA. So our work with Dana Farber is more like we do the recurrent mutational drivers of cancer. So why we so so basically we really do this on the very basic genetic level. So what's the motivation for that? For to do mutational profiling, uh, because we believe the somatic mutations play a large role in cancer development and the disease progression. And also, uh, most clinical guidelines are based on the single gene mutations. And then if you can classify the patient on the pattern of mutation, then you're going to get the result really informative. Because you're able to identify the meaningful subgroup of patients, then you can provide targeted treatment. OK, because usually, if, um, I think for this audience, all of you know the cancer treatment usually is very invasive. So if you choose a wrong plan, then you're going to kill the patient instead of kill the patient. So this is something very important. Then what we, uh, the challenges we have here is, of <coughs> course, uh, if you want to do subtype classification, it's very difficult. Why it is difficult? So from the bio biological point of view, what we have here is, so many tumors going to have a handful of mutations. So they change, so the gene is changed, is modified. But then the, the really the meaningful part is only a small portion of this. And then you're going to have the total number of mutations could be quite large. So you have many, many noises around, but the only the really meaningful patterns there. But you want to identify the true meaningful mutation patterns. And the second part is, even for the same cancer subgroup, even patient A is in the same group with patient B, their mutation pattern could be very different. So even they could respond to the same, similar treatment plan, but they could be different. So then the, the problem we have here is, because I'm the machine learning scientist, what we need to do is we're going to, we want to use machine learning to solve this problem. So the, the idea behind the machine learning is, uh, so when you cannot explicitly model the problem, then you want the machine learning algorithm to identify patterns from the data. Because especially in the biological field, uh, I think even with, with human, the human body is still considered as a myth for us. We, we don't exactly know how it works. So that means it's actually very difficult for you to explicitly model using statistical model or using mathematical model, physical model to simulate what's happening here. So machine learning means give me data. So I want the data to speak for itself. So I want to find a pattern from data itself. So I, I could make some assumption about the statistical distribution, but I still want the data speak for itself. So that means as a machine learning scientist, we want to identify subtypes. But then that means we have to treat each patient in a numerical field, right? So each patient is going to be a facial vector with those numerical values. So what we see here is, so this trans, uh, translation in machine learning language means you're going to have very sparse one values. So that means one means the gene has to be changed. Of course, you know, you cannot really expect the patient, even for a cancer patient, you cannot really expect that the cancer patient has all the gene changes. That's not realistic, right? Only a small subgroup, which is really meaningful subgroup, has changed. So you, if you look at the, all, the whole landscape of the gene genetic profile for this patient, only a small number ones there. You only have small number ones. But then one means something meaningful for the machine learning algorithm, because we're looking for meaningful values in order to do subtyping. And second part is the really high degree of heterogeneity in the facial values. So what does this mean? Because that means we have two cancer patients, right? And then if I want to put these two cancer patients in the same group, that really means they should agree on the same values. So for example, if I'm, uh, if I'm going to be the same group with Ikram, so we're both female. So we have this value female one, right? So we're in the same group. However, if on the agenda, if I have one and she has zero, then we're not in the same group, right? Because now, the unit assumption is they should have similar values. However, for the mutation profile, the problem is they don't agree on the same values, but they still belong to the same group. OK, and the next part is about the low sample sizes. Because uh, if you want to use advanced machine learning algorithm, such as deep learning, such as neural networks, those type of algorithm, because you want to identify patterns from data. So those machine learning algorithm, you are going to have this feature as data hungry. Because you want to identify patterns from data, so you need to give me a large volume of data. So I'm able to find the patterns. I need to get lots of examples to learn. And for human, we actually are very lucky because we have super intelligent. We actually can learn pattern from one or two examples. We can immediately tell what the pattern is inside it. But for machine, it's not as smart as human. They really need a huge amount of data in order to learn the patterns. But then for the research in, so this is very different from my NASA project. 
I found in my NASA project, we never had a problem to have lots of data. Remote sensing data has a huge amount of data. But in the biological domain, if you give me 500 patient sample size, they say, oh, this is huge data. But for neural network, 500 is nothing. OK, this is nothing. So we do have low sample size. And then for the genetic profile, it's very easy to have tens of thousands of features. So consider about this. You only have 500 samples. Then you have tens of thousands of features. How can you really learn a reasonable, meaningful model? OK, then you have sparseness. You have heterogeneity. So then the whole idea about machine learning sounds beautiful. OK, when you cannot explicitly model the problem, you want the data to speak for itself. But once you face the reality, they have the problem. You don't, you don't have anything you want for the machine learning algorithm. OK, so here I give you this real example. He got his finger finished like uh, one minute ago before I, before I left you my spot today. Because I asked, OK, T, you, you have to use, give me two real patients from the data we get from Dana Faber. Show me, OK, we do have the heterogeneous things. These two patients belong to the same group. But then the, the gene profile, they don't overlap with each other. But then what happened here is they actually really belong to the same sub, subtype. So what we have here is blue color is white patient, and the pink color is another patient. So then the each uh, uh, circle here represent the, the gene that has been mutated for this particular patient. So you can see they, if they belong to each other, then you're going to, they're going to have the same, the, the blue and the, and the red overlap, right? They don't overlap at all but they still be on the same group. Then the question is, how come they can belong to the same group? And what are those edges? So those edges actually indicate the gene regulatory network. So then we know the, so for the cancer study, we do have this knowledge base about how the gene regulate with another gene, right? We know their connection. So what happened here is, so at first you look at these two patients, they don't seem like they overlap on any those uh, gene values. However, you look at this part. So what we have here is for this part of a gene regulated network, so they, don't, they do belong to part of the sub-network. So this particular gene actually really regulate with another type of gene. So this kind of overlapping really put these two cancer patients together. So they work together. And then so another motivating example is what we have here is I want you to imagine this is our facial space. So this is the pattern, sample. Sample is a pattern we try to identify. So <coughs> what we have here is you do have lots of background noises here. So this is considered like the mutation noise. So this is really meaningful mutation pattern is the part we want to identify. But the problem we have here is when we get the data from the patients, the whole thing is already sliced in column and in rows, and then they mix it up. You know, everything is mixed up. So from all those pieces, how can you identify the sample patterns? The thing is, this color looks so similar with that colors. So when you try to put everything back together, how do you know? You have no idea how <coughs> they're going to be put back together. OK, so I hope I motivated you enough about what you're going to do. And here, another thing is subtype classification. In machine learning language means we want to find the cluster. So that means you, are, you should apply classing algorithm. So classing is one of the major uh, research activity in machine learning. So then classing, by its definition, is an ill-fitted problem. Why <coughs> classing is an ill-fitted problem? Because classing means how do you know this is the correct solution? So for everybody in this classroom, I can identify you in many different classing solutions. All makes sense, you know, based on the gender, based on the hair color, based on your academic background, based on your personal interest. All of those is a valuable, you know, interesting, meaningful classing result. So how can I know which one is good, right? And also because classing means you try to exploit the data set. You really don't know. You don't have a guidance. You want to explore the internal st structure. So how can we do this? And then because you do genetic data, as I just explained, we do have the curse of dimensionality. So for the machine learning algorithm, what we have here is the more features you add into data set, and then it's more difficult for you to cluster those objects. Why? Because in the high dimensional space, each object actually really equally to each other. So that means you don't really have group inside it once you have high dimensionality. So I use this example. What we have here is in the one dimension, you can see the cats and dogs are clustered together, right? Then once you move on the two dimensional space, the, the training set you need to be able to recognize the whole data set is already about this size. And if you go to three dimensional space, then the size of training data 
is actually going to grow exponentially. So once you have this word exponentially in the computer science algorithm for the complexity level, then this is something going to be anti-hard. So once you have a really high, uh, because for the genetic data, this is the nature of the genetic data, you do have high dimensional space, okay. With the curse of dimensionality and for clustering, this is going to be extremely difficult. And of course, we do have a solution for that. And that is why the project was founded by NVIDIA and NSF. And then this is work primarily done by Tianyu, okay, over the last one year. So we propose uh, a new neural network design, okay, model. So in the new neural, neural network design model, what we do here is we try to uh, battle with the sparseness, heterogeneity, and then we also want to put a prior domain knowledge, the gene regulatory network graph into the, the neural network design. So how can we do this? So uh, what we have here is, so this is a data set we face. So for this data set, each one, so each column represent one particular gene, and each row represent a patient, okay? And then for each patient, the number of ones you have here will be very few, because this is the gene has been changed for this particular patient. And then, and you can see for each patient, you. The, the way you have value overlap is going to be kind of like a rare event, as I just explained. Even for two cancer patients, they belong to the same tumor, they're going to develop different mutation patterns. And then what we know is the domain knowledge we have here is the gene actually, you have the driver gene, you have the passenger gene. So that means one gene change is going to impact the change of the other gene. So that is why even for two cancer patients, they have different uh, gene mutation profile, they still be on the same group because they were driven by the similar underlying principle. So what we're gonna do here is, in order to do clustering, if you have a data set like this, to do clustering is a nightmare. Why? Because each object already far away from each other. So the natural solution will be you should have four clusters. That's it. So you don't really have any group. Then the first step is we want to do smooth thing. So the smooth thing means we actually can ch you can see the value one becomes 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So what what's the idea? The idea is if that particular genes get connected with that one, so instead of put zero there, we want to put some value between zero and one. So this is smooth thing. We want to smooth it out. So by using smooth thing, it's kind of like a numeric way we put genetic network structure into the data set. Okay, even at the beginning, it's not explicitly explained there, but it's going to be injected into the data through this smoothing process. So the formula we use here is, so, each, so this will be the iterative, adaptive process. So for each step, we start from initial value A0, and then we're going to use this S. S is going to incorporate a adjacency matrix between each gene. And also we have this alpha, it's called the smoothing smoothing rate. It's going to tell us how quickly you're going to smooth it. And of course, this is from our knowledge base. So this is provided from our domain scientist in Dana Faber. They're going to tell us what kind of gene regulatory network we should use. And this alpha is a user provide parameter. So what should be the value used for the smoothing rate? So instead to fine tuning this using manually, we're actually going to use a smart way to learn the alpha automatically using neural network structure. So then that is the next step. So what we have here is eventually the whole thing about clustering is going to be solved by this mathematical formula. And then this is the mathematical formula we're looking for. Why? Because once we have this mathematical formula, we're able to do beautiful math. So we're able to find the result automatically through the calculation. And then that's the idea for machine learning. Okay, you want to use uh, computation to get the best result. So how can we read this mathematical formula? The whole idea is the first component here. The first component, the, up, the upper layer we have here. So this part is going to implement the smoothing part. So what we got here is we use these two layers. So it's actually three layers. We use these three layers neural networks with a recurrent neural network design. It's going to implement the smoothing function, the one the formula just showed you before. And then the second part, the three layers neural network is going to implement the clustering. Okay, it's going to do the clustering. So what we got here is the whole idea is like this. The so this, for this formula, we have two most important components. The, first, the WAH is actually learned from the neural network design, from the weights 
and then the H is from the second edges, the first layer and second layer. I'm not going to go to mathematical details. So what we do here is the design we have here is called the autoencoder. So autoencoder means you're going to have the same input at the same output. So both are the same. Okay. And then we have two hidden nodes. Through these two hidden nodes, we're going to we're going to do, we're going to obtain W and H. And the classing solution is actually controlled by the coefficient value you learn in the W. And then the alpha, the alpha is learned through here. So what we have here is everything is controlled by this objective function. So this is the objective function. We want to minimize the cost. The minimize cost means we learn the W alpha H. This is what we learned, predict the value. And then we compare the learned value with the ground truth, because the ground truth is the same as the input value. And we want to minimize the value. And the, in the second part, we're going to apply we're going to do the smoothing part here, which is going to propagate 1 to 0. Okay. So the alpha will be learned here, and the S is the gene regulated natural structure. Okay. So the gene regulated natural structure S is incorporated here in this recurrent neural network design. So the, the, the regularization is done through the sample adjacency matrix. So I, I know the whole thing sounds quite busy and complicated. Then the overall idea is you have two different neural network design. They're going to stack on each other. Okay. The first part is going to deal with smoothing. We're going to populate one through zeros and through the gene regulated network. So the smoothing is guided by the domain knowledge. It's not done by in a ad hoc way. Okay. And the second part is we're using the autoencoder to, to do subtyping. So, but then the autoencode doing subtyping is through this optimization function. The optimization function means whatever you produce here must be generate exactly the same as before. So that means you put those patients into clustering, and you should be able to put those clustering solutions back to their original distribution. Okay. So we learn this result here, and then in order to avoid overfitting, because the problem we have here is you have low sample size. When you have a low sample size, <coughs> and if you use such a complicated model, because this is a very complicated machine learning model, you, you, you're going to have this uh, problem, overfitting. Okay. If you use a really complicated model with a limited sample size, you have overfitting problem. So that is why you have to control, you have to control penalty. So this is a penalty for us to deal with overfitting. So you're going to apply regularization. And then the regularization is actually done with the sample adjacency matrix. So that means we're actually going to compare each patient to learn their adjacency. And then here, the edges will be penalized based on the similarity between each patient. So we evaluate our result using this simulated data. So for the simulated data, what we have here is we have the real. So this is the true gene regulation network. We're using the true gene regulated network. However, we generate our fake artificial pathways through the gene regulated network. So then through these uh, two pathways, we're actually going to generate. So any genes on this pathway could be mutated, right? So we use our mutating rate to generate the how those patients get the gene mutated. So we have two subtypes. And of course, we're going to generate the other mutation noise. And then the, this uh, simulation data is actually generated from the real patient data. So that means for each patient, the frequency of mutation is based on the frequency of real patient. But the, how those mutations are distributed is really based on our artificial design. Okay. However, the artificial design is based on the real gene regulated network. And you can see for the, for the experimental result, for a preliminary result, we have two comparative studies. For, two, uh, for the four comparative studies, the first one is a proposed method, of course, because that one has the highest accuracy, right? It's supposed to be. So you can see we get, it, so the result we have here, even you can see it's not anything like a 90%, 80%. However, for such a difficult problem, what we have here is actually considered state of art. So we really don't see, in the literature, we don't see any other public result can have better result than what we produce here. Because what we have is really amazing. You're able to get a cancer a patient subtyping with such a high accuracy. This is extremely difficult case. And then we can see the second part is without regularization. Without regularization is the, the one I just explained there. So that means you don't have penalty. Okay, if you don't apply penalty, you only have the first part. You only have the first part, and what we have here is uh, you, the result is actually not very good. And then you can see the first, the next part. You do regularization, but you don't do smoothing. So that means you don't really populate one to zero. Okay. So you can see the, 
the smoothing regularization is actually going to uh, really hurt. Smoothing regularization both going to control to, to contribute to the final result. And here is just simple, just a simple neural network without any special design. So that means you don't do smoothing and you don't do regularization. Okay. And also we compare this the result with another published result in nature. So we get this uh, people, so we're using the same benchmark data set used by the result published in the nature. And we can see here is for the cancer subtype, if you have two groups, four groups and six groups, we actually get a better result compared to the result in the published in the nature. And then with the three, six, seven, is uh, comparable but a little bit worse. Okay, so this is the preliminary result. And then for the next, I'm going to quickly go through for the, for a similar idea, what we do here is, is for the gene expression data. So the previous one we're using gene mutation data, but this is using gene expression data. Again, this is another different neural, neural network design. So for this particular work, what we do here is we try to deal with high dimensionality and small sample size. And of course, this time going to, we still use the gene regulated graph, but in a different way. So what we have here is, so for, the, for this project, is uh, again, Kim is working on this work, and uh, Kourash is my mathematical collaborator. So what we do here is we put molecular interaction with the biomarker discovery algorithm together, okay? So then the idea we have here is, so we had the molecular interaction, okay? So you had the protein how regulated with the mRNA. And then we design the neural network. So this is the input layer and this is hidden layers. Of course, you're gonna have the output layer. I didn't draw it here. So then each node, because the neural network has, uh, sometimes people don't like neural network because they think this is a black box approach. Black box approach means you don't really know how it works. You, you do have those neurons, you have the hidden layers. But then what's the physical meaning? Do they have any biological meaning for its neuron? We really don't know. But then in this new algorithm design, what we have here is we really gave them a biological role for each node in the neural network. So in this particular design, if we know the gene regulating network, so what we have here is <coughs> each correspondent component we have in the gene regulating network is actually going to help us design so if there are edges between the arm and two and compound one, then there are going to be edges there. If there's no connection between this one and that one, then there's no edge there. You see the design here? So basically the edges is really defined by the molecular interactions. And then because usually the type of design for neural networks, you do have full connection, right? Here, we don't. We actually just, the connection is controlled by whatever we have in the domain. And then, so then that means we have these three layers, neural network design. Then each column represents one mRNA, and then the connection here represents the gene network. We had hidden layers, for example, could be protein. Then for the last layer, we go for the full connection. So this is a typical design. Then if we, so here is, if we do have one, one gene regulated, the regulated R, up-regulated JSON, you do have edge here, okay? So the sparseness of connection is shows here. Then for the next part is, so for the machine learning algorithm, you need to have this, everything with the mathematical formula to do the optimization. Then you're able to control the whole procedure. So what we have here is once we have such a neural network design, then mathematically that neural network can be described here using this math formula. So what we have here is you, ca you calculate for each chain example, you calculate the difference between the predicted value and then the ground truth. And then the second part, you control the penalty, regularization. Why you want to do regularization? As the problem explained before, if you use a complicated neural network to learn pattern from data, you're always going to have overfitting problem. So that is why you want to apply regularization. You want the model to be more general, okay? So then what we have here is the last function penalty term, when we have this with this neural network design, then here the last function, you're going to have two set of matrix, the W1 matrix and W2 matrix. W1 matrix represents the connection from the first layer and the hidden layer, and W2 represents the connection between the hidden layer and output layer. So with these two layers, what is the computational challenge we have here? The computational challenge we have here is the, for this optimization problem, again, we have the same problem. The feature space is much bigger than the sample space. And then the second thing is for the machine learning algorithm, all the machine learning algorithm assume each 
feature is independent from each other because this is how the statics model is built up. And here for the for the gene profile, what we know is they have connection from each other. So that means you have lots of correlations between those feature variables. So how can you do this? If you simply apply the machine learning algorithm, you're going to get a really poor result. So what we decided to do is the for the penalty, for the regularization, so recall we will have two weight matrix, right? Matrix one and matrix two. What is matrix one? That is one from the input layer to the hidden layer. That is the one you have the gene regulating network structure, right? So that input is hidden. And the second one is from the hidden to the output. Hidden to the output will be the part really do the real job because you want to do classification. So what we decided to do here is we're going to do two different type of penalty because in all the battle with overfitting, we do L2 and L1. And the part, so if you simply look at L2, L1, they don't have any uh, physical meaning. So this really is a mathematical tool, you do L2, L1. However, the motivation for us to choose L2, the motivation to choose L1 is biologically justified. So I'm going to explain the reason why biologically it's more meaningful you do L2 here and it's more meaningful for you to do L1 there. So here I'm using a real example. So for this real example, you can see what we have here, you have 72 observations and 3,571 genes. So for any machine learning algorithm, this is a such a small data set, okay? And if we, we want to use neural network to do classification using such a data set, it's gonna be a nightmare because this feature space is much larger than the sample space. So here I want to show you the graph to show how it looks like with L1, L2, and then the one we propose here. So lasso is considered as L1. So what is L1? So L1 means out of 371 features, if you use L1 regularization, the neural network is going to select 72. So that means only 72 out of 3,000 features will be used for neural network, okay? And then if you want to do L2 regularization, what we happen here is, L2 is much more like a team player. It says, okay, all the 3,571 features will be used. They are going to work joined together for me to do classification. <coughs> so which one should I use? We don't like any of those because this is seem to be too harsh. You only use 72 of them. And for that one, we think this is too much. Not all the 3,000 features are going to play a role. Maybe you shouldn't use all of them. So we want to have, a, so our proposed idea is we really should use combine L1, L2 together. So this is going to be a hybrid approach. So that means every gene that is highly correlated and then entering the average score into the model. So that means this is the, like the combination with L2 and L1 together. So then this is the mathematical formula we just discussed, L2 and L1, okay. So then what we have here is, then the whole thing is if you, uh, because this is really like you try to do regularization based on the gene regulating network using the graph model for the regularization. So in the literature, we do have published work using a graph structure to do regularization. The problem is it's computationally expensive. And here, because the design we have here, the design we have here is actually going to give us a huge advantage. Why? Because in order to incorporate the graph structure, we already have the graph structure here. Recall, we do have this edge to indicate the graph structure. So that means if we here, we just apply L2, and here we apply L1, then we actually can really achieve the graph structure regularization, but with minimum computational cost. So then look at what we have here. The reason you do L2, recall L2 is like a team player. So that means L2 has the nature to group feature together. If you're all going to play a role in the final result, maybe with a larger weight or a smaller weight, I'm going to group you together. So here, because we really don't know, because this is a machine learning, right? Machine learning means we don't really know what kind of domain knowledge plays there. So we use L2 regularization. If these two features really work together, so L2 will automatically, mathematically find out they actually work together. They're going to put similar weight with these two edges. They're going to be done automatically. And then for the last part, why we want to do L1? L1 is kind of like a dedicator. It said, okay, only three, so out of 3,000 fish, only 70 of them are going to play a role. I want to only select 70 of them. So L1 means out of those 40 connection edges, I actually only going to select 10 of them, the 10 most important ones. So then this is actually really the way we want. Why? Because 
when you do clinical trial, you really want to know which protein going to play a role here. So we, we really don't want to give me 3,000 proteins. If you can give me the 10 most important protein, this is the really the result I want. So the L1 regularization is going to pick 10 out of these four connections, and then with minimum computation cost. And then there's some fine tuning for, the, for this um, L1 regularization. So what we have here is, so if there's some gene really has many connections, we actually don't like it. So that is why we have a penalty, additional penalty for the really busy gene, okay? So this is a small uh, tuning part for the proposed algorithm. So I'm going to be, I'm running out of time. I'm going to be very quick about our experiments. So we have two independent data set. So one is for the kidney trans transplant from two different sources. So this data set is totally independent from the second data set. Even they have similar features, they are working on the same problem. And the same thing for the other data set, okay, from two totally independent resources. So the idea is we want to use the real data set to evaluate our algorithm to see, okay, if you train your data on one data set, can you get a better performance on the another independent data set? And then and also we train our models with a different setting because we change, we have new artificial neural network design. So we're going to compare our artificial neural network design with the other type of neural network design to see whether, because the way we design the neural network, we do have a biological meaning for this. The way you have edges, the way you do regularization. So that this regularization get a better result is simply by chance or you really do have good result. So the comparative stuff really makes sense. So then what we have here is through those experiment results, we found out the uh, proposed method always get much better result and with low variance. And then also for the independent and the cross-validation testing, we found out our model always get a better result. And then we also need to find out because the way we design neural network design, the, the hidden neural does have a biological meaning, okay? So for this particular one, we want to find out. So for the neural that really has the highest weight, that this really have meaningful reason for this. So we, we work with our domain expert in biology, and then this is really very interesting because when we design the <coughs> neural network design, so T and I were both in computer science, we had zero, almost zero background in biology. And then what's the really interesting part is we found that we check out the correspondent hidden neurons that has the highest weight activated by the machine learning algorithm, and we found they do associate it with this particular kidney transfer disease. And the same thing here for the old protein in the hidden neurons. Okay, so just pick one example. We found out they, they do has correspondent fixed meaning with this particular disease. So then the conclusion, so for this research, for this ongoing research, what I found out is uh, if you want to get good result, you want to have physical meaningful result, so you really need to find a smart way to integrate knowledge into your machine, machine learning algorithm design. So that means when you design the machine learning algorithm, you want to do this. And also, if you want to have advanced machine learning algorithm, you're going to have the problem of the data hungry, okay? So how can you avoid overfitting is you, you want to either through regularization or through the, the way you design the algorithm, so you can better cope with data pool problem, okay? So then the, you can Google our name on the internet, so, and also this is our contact information. And then for my research group, usually uh, each semester we have a one hiking trip to New Hampshire, so has the group outing together. So any question, you can feel free to send an email to us. And hopefully, I hope Tian Yu, maybe in next year, can have a chance to himself come here to present his latest result. Okay, I'm done.